Hello. It's a bit of a special occasion because on July 13th of 2020, almost exactly three years ago, I started regularly uploading videos. Two days after that, on the 15th, I uploaded my first automation video. I was very into DTM racing at the time and really loved the crazy bodywork the cars had, so I decided to make my own and it was terrible. The entire front fascia was about five fixtures, the paint choice was terrible for a race car, I didn't give it a livery, which is such a huge part of the race car look, and worst of all, I called this a DTM body kit? Really? In the three years I've been doing automation for this channel, except that one time I quit, I've come a long way. So let's build a better DTM car. By the way, I know it's a bit of a YouTube cliche, but if you enjoyed this video, please watch until the end. I have a couple announcements to make that I can't naturally fit into the flow of the video. In the background, as I've been building this, the DTM fans among you will have noticed that I'm very much ignoring current regulations, and there's a reason for that. In 2019, they switched to turbocharged inline engines, and in 2021, they just switched to plain old GT3 cars. Particularly that second change is boring, and so I've gone back to 2018 for this build when DTM cars were still unique and still used naturally aspirated V8s. I've paid much closer attention to the regulations this time around, to the point that they actually caused me problems, but we'll get to that later. For now, I'm getting to the end of the engine build, so let's hear how it sounds. For a 2018 spec DTM car and automation, there's only one body you can reasonably use, which is why in my original video I used a Polestar 1 body instead. This time though, I'm doing it right. I do some body morphing we'll ignore for now, and then I move on to the rest of the mechanical stuff. DTM cars use sequential transaxles rather than transmissions, but we can't do that right now in automation, so I've gone for an auto-manual gearbox, which I can convert in beam to a regular sequential. I can't actually get the real-life tire size on this car, though I cannot remember whether the front or the rear is the problem. It has been a month and a half since I started this build. There's not much to note in the next few menus until about now, where I will mention that DTM cars have absolutely no assists. Traction control? ESC? ABS? Even power steering? Nah. Following the regulations as closely as I can results in a weight that is some 600 pounds too low, so I eventually have to be a bit unrealistic and go for a heavier chassis, bodywork, and whatnot. Eventually, after settling for close enough and hoping the billion fixtures I add while styling will add the last little bit of weight and beam, I tune a bunch of stuff, excluding the arrow, which we haven't gotten to yet, and then make a mistake. Using rulers, I set the track width to the real-life spec. This is usually measured at the center of the tires, if you're wondering. But this looks way too wide, so I just sort of narrow it a bit. Should be fine, right? So I fake some racing slicks and move on. By the time I realize that trusting the real-life spec is a bad idea, it will be too late to change all of the 3D bodywork I've placed. I guess I'll explain that while past me struggles to cut out bodywork for the fenders. Basically, regular track width is measured from the center of one tire to the center of the other tire, but for some reason the measurement I found online was taken from the outside of one tire to the outside of the other. So, because I moved the center of my wheels to where the outside of them should be, my car is half a wheel too wide in each direction. It was helped a lot by narrowing it before I built the fenders, so it's not awful, but it's easily noticeable on the final car if you look from the right direction. The body kit, or lack thereof, was the biggest problem with my original DTM car, so that's what I'm starting with here. For the front end, I used these curved pieces to connect the fenders to the front bumper, and after taking some time to add a placeholder grill, make a splitter, and line the inner fender with plenty of little rectangles, I use a few rotated duplicates of those same pieces to make the bodywork curve upward to meet the fender flare. 
I ended up reworking this several times throughout the build, though it was all off camera, mostly because I wanted to be able to make the lower grill wider without clipping into the 3D pieces. You can ignore this bit, it's genuinely awful and will be completely replaced later on. One of the most unique features of DTM bodywork by 2018 was the cavernous side cutout, so I do that next, having to use plenty of negative patchwork because Otto really does not like extensive bodywork mods like this. I use a few big rectangular pieces to make a box to fit all of my bodywork inside of, and then after doing some experimentation off camera, I pick a fixture to connect the front fender to this. This is one of only one or two intentional inaccuracies in my bodywork. The real cars would use a big, simple triangle here, but I think that looks bad in automation, so we're doing this the harder way. There's this weird arrow bit below this slope, and I didn't realize until a few weeks after filming this part that I've done it wrong. It's meant to taper towards the door of the car a bit. Not a huge deal, but I thought I'd point it out. This arrow bit, I don't know what it's actually called, takes sort of an S-shaped curve down to the lip on the side, while also… eh, whatever. I can't explain it, you'll just see what I do. I add a little ramp thing here to smooth out the transition, then begin the tedious process of aligning my fender lining to the curved bit. This is boring, so I won't show much of it. I do some basic front styling that looks terrible, so we'll skip past it because I'll replace it later. The only thing of note is this grill piece I use to mold the body around the headlights. It will be used for the final design as well. The front of the rear fender is something I had to spend a lot of time thinking about, because it's a fairly complex shape that we just can't do in auto. Instead of the smooth fender the real-life cars have, I had to settle for this good enough solution, another of those weird sloped fender pieces on top of some flat patchwork. It looks a little weird, but there's no way around that with the fixtures we've got, and the weirdness is a lot less noticeable with an actual paint. That's the point of this ugly clay material, by the way. It emphasizes every little janky shading thing automation does, so I can try to minimize that before choosing an actual paint. Not to mention, if your car has an actual paint color while you're styling, it will be hard to objectively pick a color later, since you're used to it being red, for example. I sharpened the edge of the rear fender flares by just adding extra narrower versions of the same fixtures. This results in a more even transition to the inward curve I just added. Next, the make or break thing with a DTM car, the rear bodywork. For this, I'm essentially using the same trick as I did for the front. After placing some rectangles to attach it to, I use plenty of quarter circle pieces each rotated a bit to make a curve. Because they end up also sticking out ever so slightly at the bottom for geometry reasons I can't begin to comprehend, there also appears to be a slight molded arrow bit at the bottom. The real cars don't have this, but we can pretend I did it on purpose. Once I place these triangles, you can see what I have already begun to realize at this point. The car is too wide. However, at this point I've been working for over a week, and I decided not to change anything because it would take too long to realign things. Okay, at this point I've moved on to the diffuser. I had a really hard time finding reference images for this, so this is really just my best guess from the images I could find. It should be good enough. I reworked the diffuser once or twice before I was mostly happy with it, and because it's fairly repetitive, we'll skip ahead. I give the car some massive side exit exhausts. It's notable that because I hid the actual exhaust path so it wouldn't just clip through the interior, the exhausts themselves disappeared in beam. To fix this, I had to place duplicate exhausts in the same place. It's pretty clear at this point that the car is missing something. That giant DTM rear wing, of course. I use a couple wing supports from the modular wing mod, as well as two wing elements. I experiment with a few end plates before deciding on something I was a bit worried about for beam arrow. A full wing fixture with most of it hidden, then flipped, then rotated, and scaled a bit to give me the shape I want. My worry with the aerodynamics in beam was that it would act as an air brake or even a source of lift, but it turned out to be either fine or indistinguishable from the ordinary drag introduced by 2,000 pounds of downforce. 
Yes, DTM cars share a lot of DNA with F1. One of the similarities is the theoretical ability to drive upside down, and while I was researching aero specs, I found a mention of the 2018 Mercedes car making its own weight and downforce at 124 miles an hour. That's the downforce amount I went for as well. I add a few dive planes, apparently that's what they're called, tune the downforce, realize my car does not make enough top speed anymore, and compensate by tuning the engine up to over 560 horsepower. This is another break from the regulations that real cars make, quote, over 500, so probably 520 at the most. I'd rather have the downforce and the speed match than the power, though. I very lazily added DRS mechanism, I had planned to make the DRS actually work, but when I exported the car two days before my originally intended upload date, I decided not to take the time to learn that particular JBeam mod. Let's fix that front end. I add some hood vents, then start throwing ideas at the wall until I eventually land on this grille shape, which looks promising. Initially worried about making a Mercedes look alike and then eventually not caring, I give the grill a metallic paint, and then some vertical grill bars for that German look. This on its own is not all that unoriginal, particularly by my standards. In my personal creative low point, shortly before I quit auto I made a rip-off BMW 507 and a rip-off Koenigsegg to follow it up. But then, after working on the lower grill a bit, I decide to do this. That is a Mercedes. Ah well, it's a decent design and creatively bankrupt beggars can't be choosers, so we'll stick with it. And in all seriousness, it's not that derivative, I think. I line the entire headlight, close it in, and then spend some time making an LED design completely from scratch with absolutely no AI help whatsoever. I doubt the real cars would just use simple LEDs like this, but the only thing I'm worse at than general styling is headlight internals, so LEDs are what I'm going with. I'll tweak them a bit later off screen, removing that weird bit that sticks out on the bottom. After putting it off for a while, I finally get around to the lower grille detailing, which is a little tricky because despite having plenty of reference photos of it, I can't really tell what I'm looking at. Ah well, here's my best try. Know that there's some bodywork behind the grille that slopes up towards the radiator, which gives it some depth, and little details like these supports, I guess they are. Later on, though I forgot to record it, I'll add a toe strap as well. Here's a fun thing that I didn't bother to do in the original video. DTM cars, at least in 2018, have these interesting front license plates. They were ditched in 2019 in favor of just being part of the livery, but I like the plates, so using some simple shapes and plenty of repositioning, I make that. If you're wondering, this is the symbol for the German post. They sponsor DTM, so the cars get that plate. The front end is pretty much done now, so next up is the rear styling, which surprisingly doesn't take me that long. I start with this license plate cutout, then pick some taillights and line them up with the top of that. The taillight LEDs also go pretty quickly since they're pretty much the front LED design adapted for this different housing shape. The rear of the car doesn't get a license plate, but it does still get a rectangular decal with that post symbol, apparently called a post horn, so I just use the same pieces and scale values from the front plate. Should be good enough. Finally, I go through and add a bunch of details. A third rear light, a rear toe strap using yellow carbon fiber to mimic woven fabric, some various stuff on the roof, a wiper, supports for the side skirt, some strips, and more lights. These new bits are actual headlights and taillights, what I had placed earlier were actually running lights and brake lights. And with that, I think the exterior's done, other than, you know, the livery, but let's put that off as long as we can. Instead, I'll work on the interior. For some reason I don't remember, I neglected to record the interior lining, which is unfortunate because I've finally figured out how to get it to look good. Whatever, I'll just show you in the next video if I remember. Short version, place all the body molding at the same angle in 3D mode, and then switch it to 2D for conforming pieces with even shading. Anyway, while I was explaining that, it looks like Past Me has got the roll cage done, so next up is the seat, wheel, and pedals, placed by using a crash test dummy as a reference.
That steering wheel is a placeholder. As you'll soon see, I seem to really enjoy torturing myself, and so the plan is to make a fully custom one later. My interior is by far the least realistic part of the car, because while I did what I could, it's just very difficult to get any good reference images. Also, as if it needed to be said, being over a month into the build by now, I just kind of wanted to get done already. There was a time when I would have made all the wiring, door seams, and fasteners and such, at the height of this regrettably masochistic period of my auto career I made custom dualies for a failed Mad Max project, and later a custom engine with a full ignition wiring system for my drag car, but that time is over, and so I only sometimes do that now. What's that saying about perfect being the enemy of good or whatever? Yeah, that's something I need to take more seriously. Where was I? Uh, oh right, I'm making a DTM car. Um, the carbon tub for the interior is pretty much done, so I make an ever so slightly self-promotion version of the driver plate these cars all have in the interior. This is all very easy to do using editable text, with the exception of the YouTube logo, which required two different text pieces for spacing, and multiple patches to get the right shape for the red box. Despite having absolutely no driver assists, DTM cars do apparently have air conditioning, though the drivers usually run with it off for better performance. For me, a life without air conditioning is a life not worth living, but then I'm not a professional racing driver. Also, yes, as I add a screen and the other air conditioning vent, you may have noticed I once again forgot to film most of the making of the first vent. Ah well, after working on the same thing for so long, I was starting to forget what I was even supposed to be doing, that is, recording a video. It's custom steering wheel time now, and this is one of those unfortunate moments where I have to actually think while playing auto. You see, a steering wheel is a symmetrical object, at least it should be, but I can't mirror parts over because the wheel is not centered. So I have to check the global position of the middle piece, math out the distance of every new piece I place from that, use that to reposition a copy of it on the other side, and rotate twice with global transform so that it's facing the right way. For the curved parts of the steering wheel handles, I have to rotate once locally as well. Using some of the material slots for my placeholder wheel, I add paddle shifters as well as this DRS paddle on the left side only. I also use the DRS paddle plate for all three shifters to save space. I add some controls on the wheel, pretty much stolen from the Mercedes car's wheel in real life, because I don't know what functions are actually needed. Next is a mirror, and finally the end is in sight. Before I make a livery, I have to add a few things. I make the position screens, which won't work because unfortunately Beam does not have that kind of functionality, I recolor the sun strips and add a racing number in the windshield, I add a number card on the side having to flip the text to the other side manually because that button doesn't work anymore, I add- okay, I need to stop writing run-on sentences like this. Anyway, I add the driver flag and name on the window, and like the real cars, I'm only using three letters here. Then, yes, finally, I get started on the livery. The car will be painted in the channel colors since it's celebrating three years of regular uploads, and unfortunately this means I have to work with the color yellow, which is always a pain to do right in automation. The livery starts as a basic two-tone yellow and dark grey, just recoloring most of the bodywork I made, as well as adding grey patchwork to the front bumper. The rear license plate molding also gets painted grey to give some contrast for the yellow decal there, and I add this bit behind the front fenders to make the livery a little less empty on the sides. I also have to cut out some of the original bodywork that's clipping through. The hood vents get some darker paint to match, and then I start adding sponsors. Other than YouTube, for the simple reason that, you know, that's where you're watching this, all of the sponsors are fictionalized versions of real ones from a sponsor decal mod. I put a driver name on the roof, add some emergency stickers and another number card on the hood, and then, in need of a main sponsor for the car and given the reason for this video, it only feels a little bit overkill to plaster my channel link all over the place. I invert the window decals so they're also visible on the inside of the car, add my fictional brand name on the wing, put the automation logo on one wing panel and a custom made beam logo on the other, and… we're all done, finally.
I give the car a name, the anonymous Motorsport Hockenheim, naming it after the same real-life DTM track my original car was named for three years ago. So, uh, let's take some photos. Luckily for me, the export is pretty easy once I've moved the steering wheel to animate later. And by really easy, I mean... I exported it, noticed the headlight LEDs don't work right, tried and failed to fix it, exported, noticed that the carbon fiber texture looks terrible, fixed it, exported, the visor doesn't show up on the inside, so I fixed that, exported, saw some missing roof lining, fixed that, exported, tested the car, found out it bottoms out very easily, kind of fixed that, exported, fixed the headlights four more times, exported, animated the steering wheel, converted to a manual shifting mode in J-Beam, tuned the steering wheel lock, did some drag reduction to get up to the right top speed. Hi! It's several hours later. The car has some uh, minor problems. It mostly looks fine, as you can tell, but apparently editable text gets pretty much illegible when you zoom out, so the further away the camera is, the worse it looks. Ah well. I found this mod for the Hockenheim's namesake circuit, so let's give it a test drive. It actually handles pretty well. It's reasonably stable thanks to an experiment with zero quality tires I tried for the export version of the car, and it's also very fast. Shifting is particularly fun in this car on account of the fire that comes out of the exhausts. I didn't even have to tweak this in J-Beam, it's just the perfect amount unedited. See? German Post. As usual, it takes me a little while to get used to the car enough to push it. The animated steering wheel and the beam screen aren't just good for immersion, by the way, they're actually helpful for driving. The steering wheel helps me visualize how far I'm steering, since I can't just steer at my actual physical wheel all the time, and the screen helps me remember what gear I'm in. No spamming gears all the way down to neutral in hairpins. Anyway, that is a highly abbreviated version of a Hockenheim lap completed, but we're not done lapping circuits yet. Let's give my out-of-practice race commentary a chance to shine and do my now customary Imola timed lap. Okay, it's a fantastic launch for the DTM car. For whatever reason, when you do a standing start in this car, as long as you don't rev it up beforehand, it always gets this perfect full traction launch. I don't know why that is, none of my other cars can do that, but it is very useful. Going into the first chicane, there's no real issues with the brakes, despite not having ABS. I've never actually found locking up to be a big problem in this car. I think a wheel and pedals helps in this regard. I take this corner a lot faster than I really have in previous Imola timed laps. I think the reason for this is that I just trust this car more than most of the cars I've tested here. I don't know how, but I've managed to make a car that's relatively stable for once. The one exception to this is this corner here. Uh, I always do several takes of the lap, and in previous takes I had gotten a bit of oversteer here because uh, of the elevation change, so I took that a little slower than I needed to. In a previous take I actually hit the curb on the inside there and came to a dead stop. This car's ride height is very low, and apparently the curb has a high section. I break very late into this chicane because I know the car can do it, and sure enough, I probably could have taken it faster than this if I really wanted to. It's onto the grass a little bit on the outside because it's very difficult to judge the width of a car where the fenders are like two feet wider than the rest. Going into these last few corners, I'm feeling very confident about this car's time. It's very stable, and so I can push it a lot more than I would most cars. Finally, the ending straight, where the car can make use of all of the uh, drag reduction that I did. 
let's see what time it is. Okay, as a reminder, here's how the leaderboard looked before running the DTM car. Turns out it's pretty fast. The SBR4 hill climb car it beat is, as far as I'm aware, the fastest unmodded car in the entirety of Beam, and it's only 4 seconds behind my anonymous motor's Imola, a car specifically named after this track. Not to mention that in an actual multi-lap race, I guarantee the Hockenheim would win. The Imola is fast, but it's also very twitchy and difficult to drive compared to the consistent and relatively trustworthy DTM car, which I can push harder. I said at the beginning of this video that I'd like you to stick around for some important announcements at the end, and here we are. To start with, you might have noticed that I'm getting pretty close to an important milestone. After three years, I'm finally closing in on 2,000 subscribers. I'm not entirely sure on the details just yet, but part of what I would want to do for a video to celebrate that is a mini Q&A. That doesn't work without questions and would in fact be pretty embarrassing, so please ask away in the comments to this video, my Discord server, the community posts I'll probably make about this, or wherever else you feel like. Next, just a minor note. While tweaking the DTM car's drag coefficient to get a more realistic top speed, my PC suddenly decided to do this. It's just the latest in a half-year-long series of various issues I've been having, and so after six or seven months of random freezes, display driver crashes, and yes, I've updated my drivers, lag, weird bugs, and just a slow decline in performance, and beam in particular, I've got a bunch of new PC parts on the way. I don't have any experience with PC buildings, so it's technically possible I somehow fry something and put myself out of a fair amount of money, but... Most likely, this is the last video I'll ever make on my current pre-built desktop. So long, good riddance, and may better frame rate, nicer graphics, and in general just a smoother experience await. Finally, while I'll do a proper segment on this in a future, more relevant video, um, I got a sponsor. Yes, this video is brought to you by Connect Hosting. If you're interested in running your own BeamMP server, but for whatever reason can't or won't go through all the setup stuff, Connect Hosting has you covered with their server hosting services. They have a free trial that actually has some decent specs as well. As I said, I'll get into this more when I do an actually multiplayer related video, but if you'd like to get your own server and support the channel while doing so, go to the link in the description and sign up using my promo code on screen now. Also, I know there are no name tags because replays got rid of those, apparently, but despite how it looks, the segment really was recorded in multiplayer, with Ruben, incidentally, another Connect hosting partner channel. Okay, so, while I was getting ready to film an outro for this video, an interesting thing happened. Yep, the car broke. I found a duplicate unpacked version of the mod, but packing it didn't work either. In fact, after doing this, I found several missing folders in the mod. I had a backup copy, but that too was broken, and so I was pretty much just resolved to my fate of an automation thumbnail and no beam mod when it… just sort of decided to work again. So good news, you do in fact probably get a mod out of this video as usual. Let's just hope it doesn't break again before I can upload it. Plenty of good stuff on the way, but for now, thanks for watching and goodbye.